get there in the end. Great. Right. I'm up to over 50 people, so I'm going to kick off and say welcome. Glad to, that most folk found the right link. What an <laughs> achievement for a Tuesday afternoon. So it's great to see you here. I'm Polly Stephen um, from the General Teaching Council uh, for Scotland, so it's, it's great to welcome you all this afternoon. The very first thing I'm going to do is give you a little bit of an instruction about how to ask a question because we are very keen that you have the opportunity to ask questions, particularly of our two um, provocateurs, Herb Biesta and Joe Smith, who are joining us this afternoon. So if you look at the top line of Microsoft Teams, beside where you would normally put your hand up, there is a little speech bubble with a little question mark in it. If you click on that, you should be able to ask us a question that will wing its way to us. And um, you can start asking your questions as soon as you like to gather as much thoughts and feedback as we possibly can. I'm just going to say a little bit about what brings us here tonight, you know, what, what our thinking is behind this um, activity together. And then it's over to you. There's going to be a chance to break out into smaller groups to discuss some of the uh, thinking and um, the reflections that both Joe and Hert have um, brought to you through their videos that are available on the website. So some of you will remember back in 2019, which feels longer ago than it should be, pre-pandemic times, we were out to consultation on new professional standards for teachers and a new code of professionalism and conduct. And following a public consultation, we decided to spend a bit of time doing work to the professional standards for teachers. And we really focused on those. And I can see some familiar faces in the crowd tonight who helped us get there and did much more work to the professional standards, which were then published in January last year and enacted last August. We did get at the time of the public consultation first time around feedback too about COPAC. And we always knew that we had more work to do to it if we wanted to look at refreshing it into a contemporary code. We have decided that the best way for us to do that is to not start with the document itself, but to start with a conversation with you all and with others and with partners in the profession around about ethics and teaching. And we kicked all of that off in January of this year when we were delighted to be joined by uh, Shirley Van Newland, um, who um, very kindly offered our annual lecture on uh, ethics and teaching, why what we think, do and value really, really matters. And Shirley's lecture, along with um, Hert and Joe's provocations, are available on a special part of our website. And that is where we're going to be hosting a whole range of different voices, viewpoints, um, ways of thinking about ethics and teaching over the course of this year. And one of the aspects that we think is one of the aspects that we think is important is providing some space for us all to talk about it, for us to reflect on big ideas, maybe even sometimes some controversial or opposing ideas to really discuss what do we mean about ethics and teaching? And then ultimately down the line, what does that mean for an ethical framework, an ethical code, a code of professionalism and conduct? So we were delighted, um, Jill and I, Jill Robinson has been doing all the leading of this work and getting it all in place. And Jill and I have been delighted with uh, the response to requests for people to um, offer some input into this experience. And we were very, very lucky that both Hert and Joe said yes very early on and very kindly um, produced um, the videos that you have watched. So what I'm going to do now before we break out into our smaller groups is I'm going to go to Hert and to Joe to introduce themselves and to offer a shorter reflection on what they spoke about during their provocation. Hert, would you like to go first and say hello to everybody this afternoon? Yep, I'm no more than five minutes. Hello everyone, it's uh, it's a pleasure to be here and, and an honour. I'm uh, Gerd Bista, you can pronounce my name in, in many ways. 
and I work partly at uh, Murray House School of Education and Sport in the Institute of Education, Teaching and Leadership, and partly at Maynooth University in Ireland. And I'm originally from the Netherlands, but have been in the UK for 23 years now. Um, and the longest time in, in Scotland. Um, so it was really nice to, to get the question, but also the word provocation, because that gives you some license to, to be um, not awkward, but maybe to go for some precision and try to push some points in order to see whether there is something there. So that's really what I, um, I tried to do. Um, by asking this question about what's the place of ethics in our discussions about teaching or what is this relationship between ethics and teaching. And as you may have seen, I try to push back a bit against the idea that we simply say teaching is an ethical profession or a moral profession or teachers need to be ethical because I, I think we, we need to be a bit more precise there about what the place of ethics is and what the place of other normative yeah, considerations is. Um, so I, I helpfully compare teaching to baking to make my first point that you can have an ethical baker, but even if it says ethical bakery on the on the sign, don't expect that the, the bread will be brilliant because an ethical baker can still bake awful bread and that's one point I want to make that ethical questions about right and wrong about the ethical good should be distinguished from what I call the, the good of the profession or the, the good of teaching. So I explore that a bit. Um, also then to say yes, of course, there is a, a discussion about ethics. There is general ethics, the, the values and standards that we want to aspire to or live up to as human beings. Then there is special ethics where you say in particular professions there are ethical considerations that are important, like in education that we work with minors in responsible relationships. Uh, but that for me is different from the good of teaching itself. Uh, and there I try to say rather than calling teaching a moral profession, I would call it a normative profession in order to say that the there are value laden considerations, but they are not ethical or moral. They they have to do with you can say what the point of teaching is. And that is important to also push back against the idea of teaching as a, a technical profession or a technicist, technicist view of teaching. And I see an awful lot of language that suggests that teaching is a kind of technique or an intervention that produces outcomes. And I think that's a misunderstanding of, of what teaching is and how it happens. And then you can say the, the good of teaching has to do with what the point of teaching is, why teaching exists. And there you come into discussions about purpose or purposes of education. So I reflect on that. But before I do that, I place teaching in the domain of human endeavors. Uh, and I, I rely on Aristotle, which I think is still very helpful there. Uh, because Aristotle says human endeavors are endeavors where we have actions with intentions and those actions have possible consequences, but there is never strict causality there. And again, that goes against the idea that teaching is a cause and learning is the effect, which I think simply doesn't make sense. Um, there at some point, there is an important difference between bakers who bake, bake. Bread, they make things and teachers who educate human beings. Uh, and I say a few things about the kind of judgments you you need in both fields and that when we we educate human beings, there is not just a question how do we do that well, but also what is the orientation we work with? And then I think the biggest question we have as educators is to 
support and encourage our students to, to live their own life and to live that well. Uh, but that is not soft psychology. That means that we need to equip them with the, the knowledge and skills that we need to provide them with orientation in the, in the world and give them opportunities to, to practice what it means to, to act in the world uh, well. And for me, that has to do with sort of the, the good of teaching itself. And I would say there we don't need ethics, but we need to, to keep talking in very precise ways about what teaching is and why teaching is. So that's basically my provocation to refresh your memory in case you watched it long ago. And if you watched it this morning, then this will all sound familiar, I hope. Thanks. Thanks, Harris. A lot. You, you fit fit a lot in there to five minutes. Well done. That was that was a big ask. Um, I'm going to hand over to Joe in a moment to do the same. But before I do that, just a reminder that we're looking to collect as many questions as we possibly can. And thank you for the question in the chat bar. The other way you can do that is a little speech bubble with a question mark at the top there. So if you click on there, you should be able to post a question to the panel for a wee bit later on. So, Joel, welcome. Would you like to do the same and offer a short resume of your provocation? Thank you very much, Pauline. Um, yes, um, I um, listened to um, Kurt's provocation um, in the car. I have to say, when I downloaded it, I was despairing um, that it seems to come to a very different conclusion to mine. Um, but actually, I think what happens is um, Kurt and I start in the same places we follow the same argument um, and then we come to the same conclusion um, but phrase it differently. Um, and um, I, I think that to, to just kind of prefigure the conclusion there, I think what where it is hurt is in favour of narrowing the definition of ethics so that it doesn't intrude on questions of purpose. I'm in favour of broadening what we mean by ethics um, so that we place purpose um, at, at the heart of it. And um, an important starting point for what I was talking about, and it's something that, that, that Hurt makes reference to in his talk, um, is this question of, of, of the lost purposes of Scottish education. That over the last kind of 15, 20 years since CFE was um, kind of first thought about and first suggested, um, there has been what what hurt quite rightly, uh, uh, albeit um, you know chooses the deliberately ugly word of learnification in Scottish education, and we seem to talk about outcomes as though they are purposes, and we seem to talk about um, skills for learning, life and work, um, uh, insight data, um, you know, um, standardised tests for primary colleagues, as though they have. Um, um, in some sense supplanted questions around what we're actually doing this for. And as I say at several points during my talk, this is not in any way to have a go at teachers. Um, I, I understand that these are that these are system level considerations and that we're all kind of working within a system, um, but it has become increasingly um, common to see these kind of um, questions, outcomes, replacing um, conversations about purpose. And so I suppose what I um, have um, sought to do in my talk is two things. First of all, to, to, to chart this, um, this phenomenon. How is it that, that we've seen learnification um, to such an extent? And I, I credit it to, to washback from, from SQA examinations in, in large part. It's a provocation, I'm sure that's controversial. But I, I think we see that effect w w washing right back to, even into primary school. I then say um, what have been the effects of this learnification and um, using research that I've done with history teachers, I say that one of the effects has been that we have, um, when we are choosing questions of content with children, we're thinking increasingly in instrumental terms. Why, do, why is this something that they like? Why is this something that is useful? Why is this something that will help them get a job or, or, or some of the various um, extrinsic consideration? And that we've lost sight of um, 
those questions that Herr talks about, about the, the, the field of human endeavour and, and, and human flourishing. And my argument is that um, you can't take those questions about human endeavour and human flourishing seriously unless you take knowledge seriously. And, and I actually draw on um, Herr's book very heavily in, in this, um, in, in making the point of saying that we are teaching children, um, yes, to become um, independent, free thinkers, subjectified people, but we are also inducting them into a world that already exists. Um, and given that this world has already exists, given that we have lived in it longer than our um, students have, given that we know more about it through various ways than our students do, we have a responsibility to, um, to take those questions of knowledge um, more seriously than we have been perhaps. Um, and that's it in a nutshell. I think those questions of knowledge are fundamental to teaching. I think they've been um, a little bit um, overshadowed by other conversations in Scottish education. And I think bringing that conversation around knowledge back in is important. And I think fundamentally it is an ethical and a moral question and, and we can't or shouldn't get away from that. Great, thank you so much, Joe. Um, good job, both of you, for that summary. Um, what is going to happen now is that everybody is going to magically go through the atmosphere into smaller groups. You're going to be in a group of up to about nine people. Someone in the group has already kindly volunteered. I'm not sure if volunteered is the right word. K kindly agreed <laughs> to facilitate and take notes. And um, we look forward to seeing you in about half an hour's time where we will have some panel discussions. So please remember to pop your questions into the um, question bubble. And with that, Fraser, I think you press a magic button and groups happen. Your curriculum hasn't exposed children to the most important kinds of questions around um, climate change, um, legacies of, of uh, imperialism, all these kinds of questions. Um, and I think that is ethical. And I think that ultimately it's about teachers being able to, to look at themselves in the mirror and have they acted with integrity in making sure they've given children access to the things that they need. And if the answer is no, then I think that's unethical. Thanks, Joe. Herbert, what, what, what are your reflections in this space? Yeah, so I think that's a really good point that you find an ethical question there for yourself where you say, have I, have I lived up to what I need to do in order to be a good teacher? And, and Joe, I think in the conversation in the, yeah, we had, you said, can you look in the, in the mirror and really say that you have lived up to what, what it requires to be a, a teacher? I think my my hesitation about putting the word ethics everywhere is that I, I think ethics is not enough. And I would say if you know everything about ethics or even if you're very ethical, then you're not yet a good teacher. So to be a good teacher, you need something more. Uh, and that more is not just your technical skill or your knowledge, but that's also normative. There are also values there. And I think there are sort of specific educational values. So there are authors who say a good educator is one who has an ethical relation. Good parent has an ethical relationship with their children. And I always think, well, but in addition, you need to have an educational relationship. You need to have a concern for your children's future, for their freedom. Um, so that's the difference where I would sort of be in favor of giving ethics its own place and then to say, but not all the normative aspects of teaching can be resolved by just being ethical or knowing ethics well. So I think there that, uh, yeah, we're, we're looking at a slightly different question and, and together I think it, it, it fits. Thanks, Hert. Um, Hert, would you like to pick up the, one of the questions in the chat as well? Because I think it adds on to what you've already said. Mrs O'Grady, who I think is Rosemary, forgive me if I've got the wrong Mrs O'Grady, is that you Rosemary? <laughs> You're asking in the chat, 
can you be ethical without a moral code or make moral judgments without being ethical? It was me, it was me. Hi there. <laughs> so, yeah. Hart, would you like to pick up the question? Um, so the question of ethics and moral codes, I would say moral codes can be very helpful, but to be ethical is always also the question, should I in this situation follow the moral code or should I do something else? So there you can say, we always have our individual responsibility, even with, with any moral code. So there was still a difference between the two. It, then your second part, I was just curious, you say, can you make more judgments without being ethical? I wonder whether your question is about the difference between making the judgment and acting ethically, or whether you ask about the, the, the difference between the word moral and the word ethical. Do you want to, to offer? It was, it was the, the difference between the two, because to me they're quite intrinsically linked. Yeah, so I, I would even say they roughly mean the same. So we can talk about moral action or ethical action. Some people say ethics has more to do with how we theorize about moral action. But you also see that people say we have moral theories and then ethical action. So I would say the words are interchangeable in that way. Thanks, Herit. I think lots of thinking about that. <laughs> um, Joe, I think there's a specific question for you here in the chat about whether you feel that the system let teachers down by expecting them to develop the curriculum without equi equipping them rather with the knowledge, skills and agency to do this. Would you like to offer yeah. some thoughts on that one? Yeah, um, it, it's a kind of a life universe and everything question. Um, I, I think I'll pick up on, on, on a few things. I mean, the, the first thing I would say is, um, what is the system? Um, you know, did the, the system let people down? The system doesn't have agency. It's not a, a thing with a, with a mind. It's the, it's not conscious. Um, are there or were there um, contradictions and tensions? between the vision of Curriculum for Excellence and some of the already existing features of the Scottish educational landscape and culture, yes. Um, was enough done to more closely align the culture and the landscape and the stakeholders with the vision of the curriculum? No. Um, and so I think that's where this question of, of equipping becomes problematic um, because it sounds very much like um, the, 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 the hierarchies and the turf protecting is part of the problem. And yet if we talk about equipping, then we're talking about um, hierarchies and um, transmission of ideas from a system, from the top level of a system down. Um, and I think what a better way of phrasing this is, did curriculum for excellence or does curriculum for excellence require a more fundamental re-evaluation of the system, the stakeholders in the system, the hierarchies in the system, where power is in the system, um, things like teachers roles, teachers time, um, expectations of teachers, um, do all these things need to be reformed in order to align better with the, with the curriculum? Yes. So I think that's probably um, chickening out of the question slightly, um, but I think it's it's fair to say the teachers needed more than they have got. And in order to make curriculum for excellence work, if that's what we're aspiring to, um, w w there needs to be fundamental root and branch change to, to a lot of kind of taken for granted um, sort of, you know, shibboleths, for the want of a better word. Thanks, Joe. Well, well, let's not let you sort of um, shirk out of this question a little bit because <laughs> there are a couple of similar questions that have come in, well, associated, I would say, about the system. A question from, from John Devine on the other channel of chat that's asking, who decides what knowledge children need? Is it teachers? Is it a school? Is it the country? What, Joe, have you got any thoughts about that? 
Um, yeah, it, it's it's everybody. I mean, what what I am not advocating, and I'm, I hope I'm very very clear about this, is a, a some kind of prescriptive list of um, you know kind of cultural capital of of what you know you should give a tick box of children needing to know things before they're allowed to leave school. That's not what what I'm um, about. But I think there are high level questions about the world and about the future um, that hopefully we can all agree on are important and hopefully we can all agree that there are ways of helping people to access those questions and develop answers to those questions that we can all agree on. Um, that, and, and actually curriculum for excellence in my view gets this right. This does need to be done at a local context. It does need to be done in, in the context of the children in your class and where the children in your class are at and their, their, their um, already existing knowledges. Um, but that doesn't mean that their already existing knowledges is all there is or that is the limits of our aspiration in, in, in teaching kids. Um, so again, I don't know if I've answered that question, but I'm certainly not advocating some kind of curriculum as list. It, it's evil and it's counterproductive, um, but nor am I advocating a, a world which in which we say that none of it matters and X is as good as Y and, and, and this thing will tell children as much about the world as this thing because I don't think any of us really believe that. Thanks Joe. Per, would you like to come in there? Yeah, I, I, I do think in this discussion knowledge is, is a slightly misleading term. Um, and I think that the word I always prefer is understanding. So knowledge becomes very quickly something abstract and then it becomes a list and you can fight on, on about what's on the list or not. But if you say we always teach for understanding. Um, so even if you ask what it means for a student or for us to know something that that complicates it and takes it away from just saying knowledge yes or knowledge no. So I think that that word is is unhelpful. Um, because even to say I know something actually means that you understand it and can talk about it in a knowledgeable way and know your way around in a particular area. And then it then it becomes educationally meaningful, I think. And then there's of course the question, what do we want the new generation to to come to understanding to? That those are big normative questions about the curriculum, um, what, and I would say partly what what is the right of children that they they should encounter, but also what's what's the duty, what what should each child simply encounter if they like it or not. Those are the bigger curriculum decisions. Thanks, Herod. I wonder if you would mind uh, picking up um, Louise Campbell's question. Probably the first question Louise has popped into the chat. I won't read it out to save time. Can you see that one all right, Herod? Yeah, I've got it here. Yeah, so this is the, the question if, if teaching is this artistic in the, the sense of craft process that requires this mix of knowledge, skill, judgment, um, I think you become better at it over time, not just as you become better at driving a car over time. It it it, it needs to integrate and, and if you keep practicing it, you also become better at it. Um, but it's also a matter, I think, of consciousness and awareness. So even if you have all the skills and the knowledge, if you're not able to what is it? Perceive uh, a classroom in an educational way. So that's an important part of it as well. And this, yeah, we we can sort of learn a lot from other professions that have a, a similar kind of combination of knowledge, skill and, and judgment and to see how people become better at that. And I think even those professions where we think very highly of like musicians this is a lifelong challenge and it's it's daily work and it's both fascinating and sometimes difficult to, to keep working on that thanks Harris 
I think, Joe, the, Louise's second question might be useful for, for you to reflect on, because I know you touched on aspects of this in your video. Um, examples in other systems engaging with curriculum enactment more successfully. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the the thing about this is um, the, the curriculum for excellence very definitely makes you know positions teachers as curriculum makers and expects teachers to be curriculum makers. Um, but to what extent are we actually seeing whether that is happening or not? Um, you know, we, we if, if if we look at um, things like how good is our school and, and these kinds of questions and, and, and the the, um, the the way that the quality improvement officers um, operate and those kinds of questions, certainly in secondary, what does that mean? It means very it leans very heavily towards attainment. Um, and th there is less um, less awareness or expectation in, in, in secondary that the um, BGE curriculum is itself a meaningful artefact, that the children, you know, in, in lots of cases, drop subjects at the end of S2. And I think part of what needs to, to happen is that we need to, to have um, a, a collective agreement that what happens in S1 and S2 is important in its own right. That if a child studies French or geography or home economics for two years and then doesn't take it in the senior phase, um, what have they learned? What have they done? Have they done everything that we would expect them to have done? And I think um, taking curriculum enactments more seriously means taking yeah, just just taking it more seriously as 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 a as a, as a community of practice. Thanks, Joe. I can see that there's a colleague with a hand up with a complicated reflection in the chat, so I might just ask you to come in yourself. Now, have I got your name right? Iraklis, is that your name? Sorry if I not got that quite right. <laughs> it's, it's right. It's, uh, it's, you can call me Hercules, it's the same. Um, Hi. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for the, for the opportunity to raise that question, because I think that uh, I mentioned it also in, uh, in a lovely discussion we had with the panel. Um, my, I, I personally didn't think that the provocations were provocative enough, if I may, because they're not taking the purpose question to its uh, existential end. And when I say end here, I will say telos, but not with a note with a concept of purpose, but with a concept of completion. Now, my uh, my main worry is that there is like a tendency to collapse ethics and morality, which are distinct from philosophically because they're coming from genealogically from two different, um, um, let's say, practices, uh, the ethics and, uh, and morality. One is purely... Oh, I've lost you. Oh, you're back, you're back. My worry is that if we if we do that, if, and if we use them interchangeably, there was a suggestion in both papers, then in the Agambian sense of exclusion, then we're missing the political because education is within the politics. It cannot be differentiated from the politics because that is how it's being directed and how it came to be. Now, especially since we mentioned the pedagogical aspect, we know that at least in an inceptual condition, uh, education was pedia, which had to do with the plane, was completely distinct with the workforce or with the working uh, or with the uh, um, uh, with anything that had to do with work. It wasn't associated with it. Let me get the panel's reflections on that. And we did it, that. Thank you. Let me get the panel's reflections on those points and offering any real final points, Hertz, if you wouldn't mind, because we're at close to half past five and it's tea time. <laughs> OK, uh, yeah, these are these are good discussions to probe this further. So I am aware that the the, the question of the or even the, the discussion about politics and the political is, is has not been prominent. When I was reading Joe's text where he was saying questions about curriculum are ethical, I, I was inclined to say no, actually they are political because they come back to you can say yeah what Joe what you also said these are questions for all of us, not in the sense of a cacophony, but to say this is about our, our common life and that makes it, it political. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to make 
another point, but I may have forgotten about that. Um, so shall I go to Joe Hertz and you can we'll come uh, back, see if you can remember it. That's what I need to do. I'm the person that opens the fridge and has no idea what I'm there for. Joe, what would you like to say to this? <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, of course they're, they're, they're political. Um, they're political because they're contested questions about what matters and the way the world should be. Um, but, you know, the, but politics is, is the, the arena in which those things are debated and those things are contested. Um, but ultimately, the, 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 the re well, there's, there's two reasons why I made politics and, you know, I made this an ethical question. One, I was, I was asked to talk about ethics and I had a lot of things to get off my chest and ethics was a good way of shoehorning it in. Um, but also, I, I, I go back to what I said earlier, that I, I think this is ethical as well as being political because it's about this question of um, the, the rights and wrongs of what children get exposed to. Um, and as a minimum, I think that if, if while we can argue about what should and should be there from a political perspective, um, it's not ethical to say it doesn't matter. And what I feel at the moment is that we, ethically in Scotland, we're in a position where we're almost saying it doesn't matter what children learn and it doesn't matter what children understand. Um, and we're doing that to avoid the political conversation, which is it does matter. But we don't not we don't all necessarily agree on what matters and why it matters. Um, so I think I think that's where to sit in relation to those. Thanks, Joe. Hert, I'm going to check if you've remembered. <laughs> yeah, I was I was tempted to then go into a whole discussion about the Plato and Paideia and and the sophists. Uh, but maybe this is not the right time for it. But uh, I'm thinking maybe uh, tomorrow night we could cover that. You know, <laughs> I think we've done quite well. But, yeah, but it for me it goes back to the you can say that the value and what is special about educational relationships. Um, so that for me brings it back to the the point I I wanted to make uh, today. But it's definitely true that in half an hour or one and a half hour. We, we can get better questions, but not immediately all the, the answers to those as well. Yeah. Thank you, Hert. And I think that last uh, reflection there really sort of reinforces the idea that it's important that this is a conversation that develops and adds to and has different reflections over time. And I'm hugely, hugely appreciative, as as everybody at GTC Scotland, for Hert and Joe for offering their time and their big brains and thinking around about these issues. And we've got lots more coming over the course of this year that we'll be sharing with you. And I want to say thanks very much to all of you for joining this conversation. And we hope you stick with us on the ride, you know, because this is a, a, a discussion that is, um, it's not straightforward. There's not a straight line from the beginning to the end and we need to be in it together. So hugely appreciative of you giving up your time at the end of the day today and look forward to seeing your faces and your names as we continue this conversation going forward. So thanks so much everybody for taking part. We much appreciate it. Go and get your tea and uh, hopefully we'll see you another time soon. Thanks very much. <laughs>